As Ecclesiastes 3 says, for everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. 25 years ago, Pastor Phil began a new season here at UCC Medfield, a new season in he and his family's life, and a new season in the life of UCC Medfield. Over the past 25 years, there have been many seasons in our lives together. Over these seasons, Phil's daughters sang in the choir, participated in youth programs and mission trips, Beth taught preschool age Sunday school and assisted with the cherub choir, and the family as a whole have participated in the full life of our church. Phil moved our church to a discipleship-focused way of living and doing ministry together. He fostered the growth of our children's ministry and our youth ministry and our senior high ministry. He supported the growth of our missions outreach programs. Phil has baptized our children, performed our weddings, laid members and friends to rest, he has comforted us, rejoiced with us, and has been a friend to all of us. Today, another season ends and a new one begins. Phil leaves his active ministry with us and begins a new season in his own life. We release him from that ministry and begin a new season in our life together as a congregation. We will have a much larger opportunity in September at Phil's retirement celebration to share reflections, recollections, and thanks. But for today, please join me in a prayer of thanks for Pastor Phil. Loving Lord, we come to you in thankfulness for the many years of service given by Pastor Phil. We thank you for his long and faithful ministry at UCC Medfield and his love for this church family. We pray for your continued blessings on Pastor Phil and Beth during this next phase of their life. May your presence be with them as they choose new paths and explore new horizons. May they be blessed with a strong network of friends and family to enjoy the journey that lies ahead. Keep them vigorous in body, mind, soul, and spirit. Open new doors of service that will satisfy their desire to give and that will make a lasting difference in our world. May they find many receptive hearts and minds for the wisdom they have to offer and many recipients to receive their love and care. And so we end our prayer thankful for what has been and grateful for what has yet to be. Amen.
During the first part of my life, I moved a lot, about every two and a half to three years. My father worked for a big corporation, and when he got a promotion, they would transfer him to another location. I was born in Buffalo, we moved to Rochester, then we moved back to Buffalo, then to Albany, then to Philadelphia, and then to Milwaukee, where I graduated from high school. When I went to the Air Force Academy, my father was transferred to LA, and then to Dallas. When I graduated from the Air Force Academy, I was on active duty for seven years and was stationed in Colorado, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and finally Mississippi, where I resigned my commission and came to New England for seminary. While some of you may think that was way too much moving, I actually liked it. My parents had a great attitude about it, and we would study up about the new places we would be moving to, sports teams, historical sites, and frankly, I found it exciting. I would make new friends, and I didn't look back. We moved to Milwaukee when Vince Lombardi was coaching the Green Bay Packers, and did we ever become big Packer fans? Back then, they played half of their home games at Milwaukee County Stadium, which no longer exists, and my father was able to get some tickets to a couple of games. Boy, did I love that. However, one thing that I didn't learn to do with all of the moving was learning to say goodbye. It was so much easier just to kind of disappear from my old friends, and I didn't have to deal with those messy feelings. Just look forward, don't look back. It wasn't until I began my graduate studies in pastoral counseling and psychology that I learned the importance of saying goodbye and doing it well. It certainly is much easier to slip away than engaging people whom you love, with whom you have worked and played, laughed and cried, and in general shared life, both in good times and difficult times, when things went smoothly and when there was conflict. So with that in mind, I hope to say goodbye to you well, with the help from the Apostle Paul. I notice how in many of his letters, he would include words of gratitude for God and the church to which he was writing, and he would encourage and challenge the church to faithfully follow Jesus. To that end, I want to use Ephesians 1 as a way of expressing my gratitude and 1 Corinthians 16 as a way of giving an exhortation. 
Ephesians 1, 16 to 19 says, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. Paul frequently told his churches how he gave thanks for them. We find this early in the letter to the Ephesian church. We find it in his letter to the Philippian church where he says, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. And in his letter to the Colossian church, he writes, in our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. In this same vein, I give thanks to God first for calling me to this church and God's faithfulness to me during the time I have served here. And I give thanks to God for you and your faithfulness, your commitment, your desire to learn and grow and your passion for ministry. One of the most amazing things about this church is the way God has raised up great staff and lay leaders to create and support new ministries. The oldest one that I can think of is Soup to Go, which emerged out of the first disciple Bible study I led. I think it was in 2001. Soup to Go wasn't my idea, and while I fully supported it, it was completely lay led, resourced, and carried out. I think about the folks who led and continue to lead Bible studies. I didn't have to beg and plead. Indeed, the lay leaders emerged were highly motivated and carried through beautifully. People who didn't know the details would come to me and compliment me for what was going on when indeed it wasn't my idea and I didn't drive it. I would direct them to the person or persons responsible and tell them to thank them. In fact, most of the best ideas emerged from you, the congregation and the staff, and I felt like I was more of a cheerleader and encourager. Time and again, God would raise up someone from the congregation to take the lead on some ministry, and she or he would run with it and do a marvelous job. Over the years I have served here, there have been so many faithful people working behind the scenes, not wanting to be in the limelight, but wanting to serve Jesus in ministry. Some have died, some have retired, some have moved, and some are still here working behind the scenes like they always have. I could go on, but I am so grateful for having the privilege of serving with you for these past 25 years. I have learned so many things from you. I have grown in my faith. I have had the privilege of serving Jesus in East Africa through the church's partnership with World Vision and then the ministry to pastors and their wives I now have in Tanzania with my Tanzania friends, George and Siuni. So I wholeheartedly embrace Paul's statement to the Ephesian church and I say this to you, UCC Medfield, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. Now, on to 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. It says this, Keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Other translations translate keep alert with be on your guard. So why does Paul give the fledgling church this admonition? He does so to encourage them to live the gospel faithfully in a culture that was hostile to these followers of Jesus. The good news, the gospel according to Jesus, was, the, was that the day of God's reign, the kingdom of God was arriving, which then calls for a response of faith and obedience from the peoples. Mostly these followers of Jesus were from the lowest classes, slaves and freedmen, which 
put the church in an unfavorable light from the beginning. These followers of the way, what followers of Jesus were initially called, didn't pay homage to any of the gods available to worship. This angered people because they were afraid that the gods would be angry for this atheism, and when bad things happened, they would blame the followers of Jesus. There was a great deal of pressure for the church to conform to the cultural norms in the Roman world. Living hand to mouth was hard enough, and adopting a new way of living and being only added to the hardship. In Paul's letter to the Roman church, he parses what he means in 1 Corinthians. In Romans, we find these words, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Now, I've found two paraphrase versions that are particularly helpful in understanding the meaning of this verse, really that kind of open it up. The first is from the message by Eugene Peterson, and uh, he paraphrases it this way. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. The second one that captures this, and actually it's my favorite paraphrase, is by J.B. Phillips. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within. The author of a book I recently read said, the modern world is often far more determined to convert the church than to be converted by her. If we, use, if we are to effectively and faithfully minister to the world, we need to be aware of how the world is squeezing us into its mold so that we can take steps to avoid, address, counteract the pressure, and offer something better. Let me sketch for you what I see as cultural pressures that deform the church. The well-known Polish Jewish sociologist who was a professor of sociology at Leeds University in the UK for many years, no, uh, his name is Zygmunt Bauman, no relation, coined the phrase liquid modernity in the 1990s. Liquid modernity analyzed the disappearance of the solid structures and institutions that once provided the stable foundations for well-ordered modern societies and the consequences for individuals and communities. Bauman argued that our liquid modern world was unable to stand still and keep its shape for long. Everything seems to change, the fashions we follow, the events that catch our attention, the things we dream of and the things we fear. It is a kind of chaotic continuation of modernity where a person can shift from one social, political, sexual, and or religious position to another in a fluid manner. A major, perhaps the major characteristic of liquid modernity is that it needs its members in their capacity as consumers. Bauman writes this, the role that our present day society holds up to its members is the role of the consumer, and the members of our society are likewise judged by their ability and willingness to play that role. Ideally, nothing should be embraced by a consumer firmly, nothing should command a commitment forever, and no need should be seen as fully satisfied, no desires considered ultimate. There ought to be a provisio until further notice attached to any oath of loyalty and any commitment. It is the volatility, the in bulk temporality of all engagements that counts and counts more than the commitment itself. Consumers are first and foremost gatherers of sensations. They are collectors of things only in the secondary and derivative sense. Desire does not desire satisfaction. To the contrary, desire desires desire. Such is the case with the ideal consumer. The prospect of the desire fading off, dissipating and having nothing in sight to be resurrected, or the prospect of a world with nothing left in it to be desired, must be the most sinister or the ideal consumer's horror. End of the quotation. The consumer society is all about what I want and what I think will make me happy. It's all about me. It is intimately connected with the hyper-individualism, the autonomous self and the self's wants. The highest good, therefore, is now individual freedom and happiness. 
The highest priority for us as a culture and a generation are individuals and their autonomous identity and fulfillment. The most important thing in the world is how I feel and what I think is the deciding factor of my reality and thus the reality around me. Sadly, the consumer mentality and hyper-individualism has infiltrated the church to a great degree. As Mark Clark, a pastor in Vancouver, has written, what we have now is the gospel of life advancement and life enhancement. It's about how you get a better you. For the first time in history, the church, even among Christians, is used as a tool of personal fulfillment. Rather than saying, I'm part of a church for the good of society or for the good of others, people select churches based on their own personal fulfillment. Now, I've only touched the tip of the iceberg here in terms of understanding the cultural cross currents and undertones that have a huge impact on how we think and live. Paul would have us be alert to what is going on in our society, to live deeply in our faith, in the crucified and resurrected Jesus who lived for others, and to have courage to live in this countercultural way. Many studies indicate how loneliness and anxiety have dramatically increased. A 2020 survey of, by the health giant Cigna found that 61% of adults suffer from loneliness. If we are alert to liquid modernity as followers of Jesus, we will see that while riding the waves of freedom can feel exhilarating, exciting at first, when you have nothing solid to stand on, when there is no mooring, no anchor, nothing stable to attach yourself to, the result is loneliness, anxiety, depression, ennui, purposelessness, suicide. The hyper-individualism, the consumer mentality, the notion that individual freedom and happiness are the highest goals can't deliver what they promise. They are, in the end, idols. Idols can never deliver on their promises. This is precisely the point of contact. This is the resource that we have to reach a lonely and alienated world. The very last exhortation that Paul makes in these two verses is, let everything you do be done in love, or as the message puts it, love without stopping. In Paul's world, if you look at any of the literature from the time, you find absolutely nothing about the gods loving humanity. People would have found the idea that God loves humanity as bizarre. Paul's proclamation of the gospel of God's love of a God who became human and gave his life for humanity must have been astonishing, absolutely astonishing. Paul uses the word love over a hundred times in his letters. It's the foundation upon which everything else rests. Paul was so amazed by God's love, by his encounter with Jesus who gave his life for him out of love and was resurrected in power, totally changed everything for him. And it underlies his passion for the gospel. Key to this love is the we-ness of it. Paul almost always uses the plural you, the gathered church. The church is not made up of hyper individuals who happen to be together consuming spiritual things. We are a body, a family, and the love of Christ is meant to be lived out in community so that it overflows into the world. As one scholar has put it, the beating heart of Christianity is the source of its endurance and life. It's love. Ephesians, Paul talks, speaking the truth in love speaking the truth in love. So, on the one hand, Paul exhorts us to be alert, to be on guard, to be aware of those cultural forces that are inimical to God's kingdom, to Jesus' lordship, to what it means to be human, and at the same time, to address them and the people who hold them with God's greatest and most powerful resource for the church, love. The church can be that anchor, that mooring, that place of secure attachment that people so desperately need and ultimately want. It is a place of belonging to the God revealed in our crucified and risen Lord Jesus. And that's where I wanna end. It's all about Jesus, UCC Medfield. It's all about Jesus. Amen.